Many Muslims are familiar with the pillars of Iman, belief in Allah. You know about the angels. You've heard about the day of judgment in detail, about paradise and hellfire and the day of resurrection, as well as being familiar with our belief in the prophets and the messengers, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Prophet Isa, Jesus alayhi salam, and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as well as being familiar with the original scriptures to those prophets and messengers, as well as the final revelation of Allah that is preserved and timeless, the Qur'an. But one of the pillars of Iman that oftentimes many Muslims are not familiar with or their understanding of it is not exact, is the very last one mentioned in that famous hadith, the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. Belief in Qadr, the good and the bad, the sweet and the bitter. Qadr, in the English language, this word might be translated as decree, as predestination. You might use it in everyday language as fate. You might say something is written for you. You might tell your son or your daughter or you heard from your parents. It was written this way. This was meant to happen. One time as I was flying, connecting in Paris back to Detroit, I got into my seat. And it's a window seat, and right next to me, you know, the middle seat that people usually try to avoid, and sometimes stays empty for a long time. Finally, right before boarding finished, a man came and sat there, and I noticed as he's putting his things away and shuffling around, I noticed a book. It was Arabic-French translation. And this was the perfect opportunity with my curiosity to start up a conversation. So I asked him, are you learning Arabic? He said, yes. He said, why do you speak Arabic? I said, yes. And so we started talking and he asked, what do you do? I said, I travel, I give lectures on religion, on Islam, on how to better society through Islam, on philosophy of religion and the pursuit of truth. And as we're talking, he's listening and listening and listening and then he gets quiet for a moment and starts looking in front of me at the people sitting in front of me also on the window. And then he says, maktuba. I said, sorry? He said, maktuba. He said, I have had so many questions for the last few months, especially the last few months about Islam. And so many misconceptions, especially coming from France. He said, and as I'm sitting here listening to you and knowing that you're able to answer my questions, I'm just thinking it was written for me. Maktuba, is that not the right word? I said, that is the right word. I said, I just didn't know that's what you were referring to. He said, of all the people sitting on the window seats, I don't think any of them are Muslim. And if they are, I don't think they would have answered my questions. But I believe it was meant to be for me to be randomly assigned a middle seat and to be sitting next to you so that I can ask you these questions. And ask he did. We spoke for hours about Islam on that flight, alhamdulillah. And it was a very fruitful conversation. But this notion, this concept, your belief, when you say in everyday language, it was meant to be, it was written this way, it was decreed for you. Do you have choice? Do you have free will? And what is the overlap between tawakkul and qadr and many other things? This concept, this topic of qadr, by the way, al-qadha wal-qadr, can be one of the most complex and one of the easiest, depending on how you learned it. And it is one of the topics you are not supposed to complicate in Islam. Some people go to extremes and there have been deviant movements in the past who went to extremes philosophizing Qadr. But as Muslims, we can understand all of us, old and young, and refresh our memories as well. Very basic principles every Muslim needs to know about Al-Iman Bil-Qadr. Every Muslim needs to know this because it will impact you in the way you live your life and what happens to you in the next life. The first principle that we can cover and everyone here knows this, is our emphasis that Allah is Al-Alim. Al-Alim. What does that mean? Allah knows everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about every cell in your body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about every grain of sand on earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about every leaf that falls, every tree in the world. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about all of the stars and all of the galaxies and every celestial object. Not just the ones we recently discovered with the James Webb telescope, but the ones that humans are still discovering and the ones that perhaps we will never discover. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge is infinite, eternal. His knowledge subhanahu wa ta'ala includes your past your present, your future, and every alternative option you could have taken. You decided what you wore today, it's possible for you to have worn something else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of what would have happened if you wore the other thing. If you took a different path, if you had a different career, if you made a different choice, every single choice you make. Now multiply that by every living being out there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge should humble us. That we do not know anything. Al-Alim is the one you turn to with full trust. Tawakkul. You trust in him. You cannot see your future. So what do you do? You pray istikhara. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you to what's best. And that you can rely upon him. Because you know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So the first principle that every Muslim should emphasize when we talk about the word fate, decree, or qadr in the Arabic language it's a uh, very rich word. Emphasize that Allah knows all things. The next step. What's the second principle? That knowledge is placed into something that is written. In Arabic, اللوح المحفوظ. The Prophet ﷺ told us, 50,000 years before you were created, or before the creation of the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already written out what will happen until the end of times. In one of the authentic hadith, one of the authentic reports, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the pen. It's not the first thing, the arsh already existed, but the pen was one of the first things. Al-Qalam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded it to write. The pen asked, what should I write, my Lord? Write everything that will happen until the end of times. So the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the future is now placed into something called al lawh al-Mahfud. It's written out. Don't overcomplicate your understanding of where it's written and how? No, we establish what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, what we learn from the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's all written out and it is preserved. It cannot be tampered with. It cannot be changed. Allah al-Mahfud does not change. And then there's the third principle. And this is the one that I want to emphasize the most, so pay very close attention. It is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word will in English is also a weak translation. In the Arabic language, we're using the word mashia or irada. All I want you to remember from this is the following. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, happens. Whatever He does not will, does not happen. In addition to this, there are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows people to do. Because you have choice, you have free will. But He does not like those things. For example, if I were to ask this question, I think the youngest people here who understand what I'm saying would be able to answer. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like when people hurt each other or when they disrespect each other, when people violate the rights of one another? Absolutely not. We know this. And yet, do people do it? Yes. So are you thinking Allah's will means Allah wants you to do that? No. Allah allows people to make choices in this world and that's the test of this life. The free will, the choice that you have, old and young, is the exam question that you were given. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا To test you, to test all of us, to see who's best with their choices, their actions, their conduct. وَلَا يَرْضَى لِعِبَادِهِ الْكُفْرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us He does not like, He's not pleased with His servants choosing kufr, disobedience. Allah does not love that. And yet does He allow people to do that? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to have free will and that is the test of this life. Some people will abuse it, they will do a lot of evil, but they will be paid for it in the next life. They'll be given their compensation for it. And some people will persevere and be patient and do what's, what's right, what's correct, and Allah will reward them for it as well. So the concept of will is important here. Why? One time at Hajj, I overheard, may Allah grant us all an accepted journey to his sacred houses, Allahumma ameen. I overheard two brothers talking. I've shared this story before. One of them was trying to explain his answer, the answer he would give to a non-Muslim about the following question. What is our belief as Muslims 
When there's a natural disaster and many innocent children die. And usually people emphasize children because they think what? Oh, they've not gotten to the age in which they've caused their own evil or their own harm. So they'll think about children. So one of them said, I'm not sure. Maybe they were going to grow up and be evil people, so they had to die. La ilaha illallah. As I heard them talking, eventually I turned around and I said, Assalamu alaikum, if you don't mind, can I just chime in with some quick insight? I heard what you were saying. And I just want to correct what, what you were saying from the Islamic perspective. When you go through hardship, you cannot automatically assume hardship equals what? The anger of Allah. Displeasure. Otherwise, the Prophet ﷺ would never go through hardship. Hardship is a part of a dunya. It is a test. You cannot say why someone died or why someone went through hardship. You don't know. You can't see. Maybe for some people, some people may be uh, dealing with hardships because of something evil that they did. Yes, ظهر الفساد في البرد والبحر. People have caused corruption in the world to spread because of their evil actions. But for the most part, you cannot say definitively why someone, like a, a young child died. You cannot say why an animal in the forest that you cannot see or hear or know about, why that animal had to die. You can't. So at the end of the day, you're not supposed to pass judgment. Rather, you say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His eternal, infinite, perfect, complete wisdom and knowledge knows best why things happen and allows things to happen without us fully understanding why. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the burden of knowing every single thing that's going to happen to you in the future? The, the mental weight and the anguish of that? Forget just yourself. Imagine knowing all of the factors of the people around you and the things that you do, the places you go, what's happening in society. This is called the uh, interweaving, the intertwining, the irtibat, Ibn Taymi rahmallah says, the tying in together of so many things in the universe, things you can't see. So how can you claim, I know why this happened? I know why that happened. That's why the believer responds with, قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ وَمَا شَاءَ فَعَلْ إِنَّا لِلَّهُ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ To Allah we belong to Him is our return. That's why the believer does not live in the past. The Muslim does not live in the past. The Muslim does not dwell on the past except to take lessons, lessons of wisdom, what can I take from that hardship or that experience so you can move forward. You have to move forward. Furthermore, when we talk about the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some people misunderstand and they ask a very common question. One of the most common questions we receive is the following. How do we reconcile what you just said that Allah knows what everyone will do, including their actions, their decisions, whether they die as believers or disbelievers, and where they end up in the next life? With free will. Where's our will? Where's our choice? So somebody will think and say, well, it was written this way. I had no choice. Is that true? Do you not have the choice right now to pray? Did you not make the choice to come to Jumu'ah prayer, an obligation upon men? Did you not make the choice to respect your parents, your spouse, your children, and have good character in society? You made that choice. You don't know the future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the future. But Allah created you for the test of being able to choose. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنُ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرُ Whoever chooses, decides to believe, and those who choose to disbelieve will disbelieve. The whole point of life in a dunya is that we're not in Jannah. This life right here is the life of choice. But there's no accountability yet. When you die and your soul leaves your body and you're resurrected, يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ That's the life of compensation, the life of accountability. But there's no opportunity then. So make the right choices today. Allah knows what you're going to do, but did not force you to do it. You're choosing right now to do what is correct. In addition, oftentimes, when people think about Qadr, and they start to blame Qadr for their sins, Qadr is not used to justify laziness. It's not used to justify sinfulness. For example, one time, a young man said, well, the reason I don't pray my five prayers, even though they're an obligation, even though Allah will ask you first about that before anything else, he said, it's because Allah did not write it for me. Allah did not write it for you. What do you mean? He's like, look, I'm not praying. So it wasn't written for me. Do you have a misunderstanding of Qadr perhaps? Are you not understanding that you have the choice right now to pray and you chose not to pray? You're making that choice. A young woman who said she wasn't wearing hijab and the sheikh said to her, this was in a class of many students. She said, the reason I'm not wearing hijab even though I believe it is an obligation, Allah did not write it for me. He said, what do you mean? Do you have the ability to go to the store and buy a hijab? A headscarf at least? She said, yes, but Allah did not write it for me. He said, if you were to go right now, right after this class, after this seminar, go to the, the store. 
If you got struck by lightning on the way, maybe I'll tell you it was not decreed for you because you were prevented. But then, even then, you're supposed to continue. And he was, of course, being lighthearted. You make the choice to do what's right. And that is the choice you'll be asked about. How does this help us psychologically? According to a number of researchers studying the psychology of religion and mental health and the overlap between mental health and your beliefs, your aqidah, your worldview, people who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believe in the Creator, and they know that they cannot change the past, that things were decreed and determined that way, meaning that's how things happened, you cannot change it now, are happier than people who are fatalists or people who do not believe in Qadr altogether. Fatalists are those who think there's no point. I can't change the future. It's all written down, so I might as well not do anything. But fatalists, fatalism does not have, first of all, room in Islam. Fatalists make the obvious mistake of thinking what? Only with religion. Only with religion. Because when you ask them, do you go and drink water yourself or do you wait for the water to magically come to you and quench your thirst? No, I'll go and drink water. A young man here in Michigan one time at an event, he said, as Muslims, we should never be worried about any kind of diseases because we'll never get them if we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I said, yes, but we have to take precautions based on those who are knowledgeable. For example, during the last two and a half years, pretty much the entire world learned about uh, some things dealing with diseases, what's contagious, what's not, how to prevent, how to limit transmission, the effectiveness of masks or not, and so on and so forth. So I said, don't you agree that there is something we should do? He said, no, because we're Muslims, we believe in Qadr. I said, this is a misunderstanding. Do you lock your door when you leave your house? He said, yes. Do you put on a seatbelt? Yes. Do you study for your exam? Yes. Okay, when you drive your car, why don't you leave the keys in the ignition, the window open, the door open, and say, I believe in Qadr and I believe in Tawakkul. Whatever will happen, will happen. You don't do that. He said, no, of course. I said, then take measures with everything. Tawakkul is not for you to just wait for things to happen. You take action every day. You wake up, you move around, you go about. You go to school, you work, you raise your children. You drink water, you sleep, you take actions. You can't say that's how it was written and not take action. Nobody does that. That's not tawakkul. That's not belief in qadr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what you're going to do, but you don't know the future. In addition to this, there's a liberation, a psychological liberation that comes from belief in qadr. You want to be liberated? You know you can turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You call upon the one who knows all things. You pray istikhara prayer and you ask him for guidance. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you don't know. When you think about qadr, our belief in it, and when people ask basically, what is the point of life? What is the meaning of life? Do I have meaning in life? Do I have purpose in life? Yes, you do, even if you're young. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you to worship Him, created you to know Him, created you to obey Him. Do not choose any other path. And as you think about Qadr and what it does for you mentally, you also recognize what? That the things that have passed, yes, cannot be changed, but there was some benefit in you from those experiences. You might not see it now. You might not understand it. And in fact, you may never understand it in a dunya. But on the day of judgment, when people are being rewarded for their patience, for all the hardships that they dealt with, they will come to appreciate their contentment with Allah's decree. In addition to this, this was the third principle, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-mashi'a, al-irada. In addition to this, there's the fourth principle, which is al-khalq, the creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of everything. Allah khaliqu kulli shay, wa huwa ala kulli shay wakil. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created everything. Someone might ask, including our souls and our bodies. Yes, including our actions, even your actions. What does that mean? Some people misunderstand this. And in fact, there's an authentic hadith about this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us and our actions, meaning nothing can exist, including human agency, including actions, including motions, including the laws of nature. Nothing can exist without the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the ability to do, to make choices. And He gave you the freedom to make choices that are good and the choices that are bad. And that's the test. The test of life is not based on the person who's sitting next to you. Every single person in this world has a unique test for him or for her. The hardships that you go through, the blessings that you had, the place you grew up in. 
There are things you are tested with that you did not choose. Did you choose your parents? No. Did you choose where you were born in which country? No. You did not choose the year in which you were born either. So there are a number of things outside of your choice, outside of your will. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed these things to happen. This is the way that the world uh, took place. This is the way that things manifested. That you were born at this time in this place to those parents in that country. And in life, many things will come to you that are outside of your choice. And we know this. Outside of your control and in fact even outside of your plans. You will not be questioned about the things that happen to you outside of your control. You will be questioned about how you dealt with it. How did you proceed? How did you respond? What did you do to move forward? Did you dwell on the past and lose your faith? Or did you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The believer is the one who immediately accepts the results, the qadr, and then tries to learn lessons so we don't repeat our mistakes or allow ourselves to be stung twice from the same source. But when it comes to qadr, do not philosophize it. Do not make it complicated. Even when we talk to our children, we teach them these basic principles without making a complicated thing. That we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we believe in our responsibility, our accountability for the choices and the actions that we make on a daily basis. And that everyone at the end of the day will be questioned about that choice. As you work for your job, for a livelihood, for your studies, for your family, for food and drink even, or to wear your clothes, as you strive and you put in effort, you put in effort as well towards the akhirah. Again, we are not fatalists. We do not believe that because everything was written in Lawh al mahfud that you should not take action. In fact, you should take action and it was written that you made the right choices and the right action. And the way that Qadr works, there are some things we know and some things that we don't amongst them, is that the soul as it's being blown into the body, the Qadr of this person in terms of their lifespan is written out, commanded to the angel to write out the things about this individual. And on a yearly basis, the Qadr comes down to manifest. How? We don't know. It comes down from al lawh al-Mahfud to this world. And as it's going to manifest, it's your decree, your fate, your Qadr for the next year. When does it come down on an annual basis? On Laylatul Qadr. This is the annual decree. And then in addition to this, of course, there is the weekly Qadr and then there's the daily Qadr that you experience. At the end of the day, it should be a topic that causes us to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to ask of Him for help, for relief, for guidance to what's best, for steadfastness upon that which is good. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us, to guide us, and to forgive us for all of our shortcomings. Allahumma ameen. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. He is the oft forgiving, the ever merciful. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fastaghfiruh. Innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. The next time you hear someone say, it was written for you. It was written this way. It was meant to be. Reflect, if you will, on the things that we mentioned. Again, the four points. Number one, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows everything. Trust in Him. Turn to Him. Call upon Him. Pour your heart out in dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Not just on the day of Arafah. The entire year have the habit of always connecting to the Creator. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us and tells us through His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa as well as through revelation in the Quran about al lawh al-Mahfuh. That everything is written. The choices that you will make. The third is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a will, allows things to happen for many wisdoms. We cannot know all these wisdoms. And as we reflect on that, the next time you go through a hardship, do not let the devil trick you into thinking, Allah is angry with me. Why? One time a brother called and he said, you know what? I feel like Allah hates me, is angry with me, is punishing me. I said, why? He's like, because there's this thing that I want that I'm not getting. And this is a very common sentiment. Many people say this. And it's a misunderstanding. I said, how do you know that? He said, because I'm not getting what I want. I said, who said you're going to get what you want and that that is equivalent to Allah loving you? There are many possibilities. The first is that maybe the thing you want is not good for you. And Allah's protecting you. Maybe Allah's delaying it for a better time for you. But most importantly here, going through hardship should not cause you to think first and foremost, Allah's angry with you. 
Otherwise, the prophets would not have gone through any hardship, and the disbelievers who reject the message of truth would only go through hardship. But that's not the reality. You're not in Jannah. You're not in the Akhirah. You're in a dunya. And Allah tells us about a dunya. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every soul will depart from it, will experience death. وَنَبْلُوكُمْ We will test you. بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ fitna With hardship and with ease. As a trial for you, that's your test. وَإِلَيْنَا تُرْجَعُونَ And then everyone will return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for accountability. Your test in this world could be hard and it could be something of ease. Maybe you grew up with rich parents and they gave you everything you had and they spoiled you so you grew up to the extent that you never knew hardship in life. And then as you started adulthood, whenever that may be, you found yourself struggling more mentally because you're not accustomed to it. For some people, there is a test in wealth. And it's important for parents who already have wealth, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve them and bless them in what they have. It's important to teach our children about hardship at a young age to expose them to what other people are going through as well. That this life, you are not entitled to anything in it. And that is a guarantee. Nothing is permanent in this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us in what we have and grant us afiyah in this life and the next Allahumma ameen. When something happens, do not automatically think Allah wants you to go through a punishment because you're a bad person. No, rather think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is purifying you, helping you, protecting you, that there's some khayr in it. As difficult as it may be, that there is going to be something you will find in this life and especially on the day of judgment that will outbalance all of the hardship that you've gone through in this life. And the last point was about creation. Allah created everything. So turn to him, call upon him, put your trust in him. How does this benefit us on a daily basis? Number one, peace of mind, tranquility. When you know that what's written is written, it cannot be changed, you don't dwell as much on the past. You don't dwell as much on what has passed and cannot be changed. You, of course, learn lessons from it. You can grieve over it if you must, and then you move on. And the second is that you start to think about what's ahead. When you study the topic of Qadr, you start to... Or you stop saying things like, if only I did such and such, which is a trap of shaitan. You don't say, "Lo, if only I did something different. It happened now. Yes, you can say, I'm learning from, let's say, a bad choice, a mistake. I should study harder next semester. I should work harder. I should be more cautious. But we do not live in the past. The third is that it gives you the willpower, the sabir, the determination, the perseverance to move forward without as much fear about the creation, without as much fear about other people. And the Prophet ﷺ taught Ibn Abbas that if everyone were to try to harm you and Allah did not decree it for you, nobody can harm you. If the entire world tried to harm you and it was not decreed for you, not written that you could be harmed, then nobody will harm you. And if all of the world tried to save you or protect you from something that was written for you, they cannot do so. Meaning in other words, what's written is written. The pens have been lifted, the ink has dried. And the very last point here is that the topic of Qadr should humble us. You never become arrogant. You take precautions, you put in measures, but you never become arrogant. You're humbled and you're modest in the sense that you cannot see the future. You cannot see behind the scenes. You cannot see everything that's happening. So if you have anything good in this world, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. If you have any success at all, any blessing that you feel, something you should be grateful for, the things we know of and the things we don't know of. Give the credit where it's due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate our affairs and the affairs of our brothers and our sisters in every land and every place and utilize us for relief for other people. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a people of contentment, a people of resilience, a people of optimism wherever we are. Allahumma ameen.